kind of equal out among the different seasons. Um, the one thing that are, I would like to point out, probably two things for 2021, is the uh, higher, in, especially in comparison to 2020, the significantly higher harvest for the extended season. I think a lot of that was, again, because of the opportunity to have uh, both the uh, be able to hunt deer and bear on that opening weekend. And also the trend of the muzzleloader season that has essentially been decreasing since 2019. Now for this year in particular, it could be for several factors. And one of the factors that I think possibly contributed to a lower muzzleloader season was the weekends that the muzzleloader season occurred on were really poor weather. They were not helpful for hunters to be able to get out. But I also partially wonder how much influence it had uh, with the extended season opener weekend being concurrent with deer, how many people wanted to take advantage of that opportunity being that you can only harvest one bear per season or one bear per fall season, I should say for all the seasons, just to be clear. So we did see another population decline um, with this year. Now in comparison to last year, the population decline was a lot smaller. It was about a thousand bear difference. Um, I would like to point out, though, that there have been two other time frames, as you can kind of tell from this chart, roughly from 2005 to 2007 and 2010 to 2012, where we saw two, in, two decreases in the population back to back um, or consecutively. And right around those time frames, there was a harvest of, or was our second and third highest harvest that we've ever recorded, of over 4,000 bears. So in 2019, we had our highest bear harvest ever um, at about 4,600 bears. So there is potentially an effect of um, having that really high harvest and noticing those decreases in the population for the following two years, which follows the life history event of reproductive strategies for black bears. So I'm not predicting anything in the future, but that is something to just be aware of and for us to keep track of moving forward. Our harvest rates really have not changed over the course of the last 20 years or so. On average, they've been about 20%. For the last three years, they've been closer to 22%, but for the most part, have remained pretty close together. So really not any kind of vast differences. The harvest rate that we have been concerned about, though, is our female harvest rate. So in 2019, we did see an increase, especially in comparison to the average of what it had been from 2010 to 2018, which was right around 13%. Um, and now our current average is right around 22%. So as you can see, 2020 actually had a pretty high harvest, female harvest rate, but back in now in 2021, 20, uh, the harvest rate was 23% uh, or 22%. So it was a little bit lower than last year. Um, it's something that we're keeping an eye on. It's actually something that we started a project specifically when these seasons open to understand how female harvest vulnerability may change with these seasons. And that actually brings us into our next slide about uh, some of the research that we have going on right now. And a lot of these projects, actually all of these projects will be wrapping up this year and they all will have some level of impact on our bear management here in the state. So we have currently a uh, population modeling project going on that's looking at a form of population modeling called statistical population reconstruction. That is with the Gavilan group and specifically with the biometricians, Dr. Michael Clausen and Dr. Joshua Millspaw. Um, without getting too far into the statistics because they're way better at I am probably describing this than I, than I would be, but long story short, what, they, uh, what this model will actually do is it will incorporate a lot of the information and data that we already collect on an annual basis. And what it's gonna help us achieve is annual um, survival rates, uh, abundance estimates, recruitment rates, and harvest rates. And it'll also help us possibly identify where we may have data gaps, so places where we can look to try and collect more data and also help us figure out areas where maybe we don't have to collect as much data anymore and adjust and, and be able to more economically use our personnel time and, and financial resources. So that, or that particular project is gonna wrap up sometime around next fall, late next summer. We also have another project going on through Oklahoma State University with Dr. Robert Longsinger and the graduate student on that project is Brandon Snavely. He is the graduate student looking at female black bear uh, harvest vulnerability and specifically what factors affect that harvest vulnerability. Um, and we're specifically looking at 
how these new seasons may be a factor involved in that. And then last but not least, we have a, Hannah, a PhD student or candidate, Hannah Tiffin. She's working with Dr. Erica Mocktinger at Penn State University. And specifically, that project is looking at several different ideas around mange and black bear survival. So trying to understand how mange affects survival in black bears and what kind of survival rates we actually have with mange, um, which I think is going to be incredibly important when updating our current protocols when it comes to treatment and um, keeping track of mange across the landscape. So as of right now, I have no proposed changes for the 2022 bear season. Um, the dates that are highlighted in yellow are going to be Sunday availabilities or Sunday opportunities that will occur next year or this, this coming fall. Um, in particular, the uh, extended firearm season will open concurrently again with the regular deer firearm season. And um, I think the two things that I like to point out most importantly is that as of right now, we have no proposed changes for the season. And I have been approached with concerns about the bear population and where we're kind of moving forward. And the two things that I would like to mention about that are we are very fortunate in the capability of being able to annually track all of this information. So we know our annual harvest rates, we know our annual population estimates, we know exactly what our annual harvests are. So if we need to make changes, we will be able to make them accordingly and in an appropriate amount of time. In addition to that, over the last 40 years, we've done an incredible job as an agency increasing our black bear population. And with putting it, I guess, in like the simplest terms, we know the recipe to make more bears here in Pennsylvania. So if it ever got to that point, which I am not concerned about that whatsoever, but if it did, we know how to change things around and be able to um, adjust for the appropriate bear seasons and make more bears here in Pennsylvania. But at a healthy population of almost 16,000 bears, I'm not worried about it at this point. So with that, I would like to thank you. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Thanks, thank you. Emily. I appreciate you pointing out the concerns because we've been hearing that too, I think from, from general hunters. Um, and with the increase in license sales, I think more people are, are looking at the numbers and paying attention and, and pointing out the science behind why it's okay to have a little bit of a population decrease and a harvest increase and what your plan is moving forward, um, I think is, is very important. So thank you for lining that out for the hunters. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's see if I can find my presentation now. Okay, here it is. All right, wonderful. So good afternoon, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to, to speak today. And um, I hope to meet uh, uh, my our fellow uh, new commissioners soon, uh, in person. I've met, I, I've, Met, met you uh, over text um, before uh, before the Turkey Federation uh, banquet the other, the other week. So I hope to um, chat with you both a little bit after on the during the break. Um, so we actually have no season recommendations for wild turkeys for this year. So that kind of um, affords me the time to spend these ten minutes talking about our new wild turkey hen research study. And I do want to point out here on, on this slide, I'd like to kind of introduce you to um, two of our four wildlife, our wild turkey technicians. On the left-hand side, that is Grace Lewis in uh, Wildlife Management Unit 5C. Uh, and on the right is Tony Musselman in Wildlife Management Unit 4D with the hen turkeys with their, their backpack style GPS transmitters and leg bands attached um, just prior just prior to releasing them um, earlier this month at their trap sites. So let's see if I can forward this. There we go, okay. So with the help of partners, we've launched the state's largest wild turkey research project. Um, I'm really glad to, to mention that. 
We've partnered with Penn State University and the Pennsylvania Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at, um, at Penn State University. Uh, we've also partnered with PennVet um, at the University of Pennsylvania and our Cooperative Wildlife Futures Program. Uh, for this four-year study to understand why turkey populations are declining in some landscapes while stable in others. Penn State, I would like to mention, has hired a database manager for this study, and uh, Drs. Dwayne Diefenbach, um, Franny Buderman, and Andrew Moen are hiring a PhD student and a master's degree student for this project. At uh, University of Pennsylvania, Drs. Eric Gagne and Iman Annis is hiring a postdoc for this project. We're also partnering with Missouri Department of Conservation and the University of Missouri, who have pioneered the use of these uh, transmitters that we'll be using, or that we are using. Funding is also provided by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Pittman-Robertson Fund, as well as the Pennsylvania chapter of the National Wild Turkey Federation. And I want to mention also that this is a truly agency-wide project. Um, we, we have all six regions involved. We have all of our wildlife health technicians involved. Uh, most of our bureaus are involved, including and especially BATS, who is um, providing some incredible technical assistance with this very technologically advanced um, project. And of course, marketing and Bureau of I and E are very involved with this. So we have four main objectives uh, for this four-year study. Uh, first and foremost, we will determine how hen habitat use and movement behavior vary across the state and uh, as a function of weather patterns, habitat types, uh, and predation rates. Second, we will assess uh, what impacts, what factors, I should say, impact hen survival and how those factors differ um, according to the different habitat types. And then third, we will learn more about what impacts uh, hen productivity and poult survival, such as weather and habitat. And then finally, we will determine how prevalence of the common wild turkey diseases in Pennsylvania varies and affects hen productivity across the state. Um, we're also going to be determining the probability of co-infection, uh, that is, hens that are simultaneously affected by different diseases, uh, and how that might affect hen productivity. So we're working in four wildlife management units that resent, represent uh, varying conditions across Pennsylvania. Those conditions are um, various habitat type and quality, turkey harvests, uh, hunter densities, as well as spring hunter success. So you can see here we selected uh, wildlife management unit 5C in the southeast region, and uh, so that is some of our more urban landscapes. And then we go up to the Northeast region in Management Unit 3D. Uh, so that has large tracts of forested uh, public lands interspersed with large human developments. And then we go out over to the North Central and the South Central region in 4D. And we have where we have large tracts of public forested lands up on the ridges. Uh, and, and then your more industrial agricultural areas down in the valleys. And then finally in 2D, which is shared by the Northwest region and the Southwest region, where we have a very diverse mix of excellent habitat types. So each winter we are, um, we are fitting 100, tra uh, 100 hens with backpack style GPS transmitters and leg bands, and we're collecting biological samples. So we'll have 25 hens sampled per, per study area for a, you know, a total of 100 per year for four years. So our total sample size will be over 400 turkeys. Um, 
the biological samples that we're collecting are, as you can see here, blood samples, uh, and we're also collecting um, clo cloacal swabs as well as tracheal swabs, and those will be analyzed for diseases by University of Pennsylvania. I do want to note these GPS transmitters that you can see in the, in the center photo there. Uh, they not only pinpoint the exact location of the hens, but they're also equipped with um, a new technology in order to determine what the hen behavior is actually, what she's actually doing in that particular habitat, whether she's resting, walking, feeding, flying. And so these transmitters um, are, you know, are going to be able to tell us exactly what she's doing in that exact habitat that she's in. University of uh, Missouri are the ones that, um, that developed this technology. Well, they didn't develop. They're the first ones to have used this technology. So over the four years, uh, hens will be monitored year-round by field crews. Oh, and I do want to mention that we have hired temporary field crews for all four of these wildlife management units. This is um, Heather in the, the northwest region. So. Uh, this monitoring includes um, hens being located regularly, and they'll ha they will weekly download the location data as well as the, their activity data. Uh, the field crews will retrieve mortalities within one to three days of, um, of a mortality event so that we can determine the cause of death. During the nesting season, uh, once a hen vacates the nest, then the field crews will determine the, the nest fate and the clutch size. We'll determine pulse survival by um, conducting pulp brood counts. Vegetation analyses of each nest uh, will occur to determine the, the habitat impact, how the different habitat impacts on nest fate, nest success. Oh, and then we'll have online, we will check the online weather data within one kilometer of each nest so that we can um, extract specific um, weather analyses so we can assess the weather impacts on nest success. And we'll also determine if hens that are positive with various diseases at the time of capture have different nesting rates, uh, different nest success, or clutch sizes so that we can assess the impacts of disease on productivity. And then finally, we'll determine how all of those factors interact and affect uh, hen movement behavior and overall productivity. So um, in conclusion, I'd like to state that this study will really allow us to understand the dynamics and limiting factors of turkey populations for more effective population management strategies to help improve turkey population trends uh, where they're needed. And so I would like to um, finish this presentation with about a 10 minute video of a hen being released in Management Unit 5C, uh, Northampton County earlier this week by Grace Lewis. And you'll be able to see that, that transmitter, um, you, can, you can see the transmitter uh, upon release, but within a few days that hen will preen that, that backpack transmitter within her uh, feathers so that um, it really isn't more than just a, a bump on, on her back that is actually able to be seen. So there she goes, she flew perfect. So what we're really looking there is make sure that the hen flies off um, well, that she's not struggling with that, uh, that transmitter, and that was a, a perfect flight. Thank you for your time, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, just Brian. But you had mentioned 400 birds? By the end of this study. Yes, by the end of the study. And that's a, that's a minimum of 400 birds. Say, for example, um, well, so each year we will be buying a hundred transmitters. So uh, we will have, you know, we'll obviously have mortalities throughout the year. So 
if we can deploy those, um, those other, tra other transmitters, previously deployed transmitters, we will. We're trying to get two nesting seasons per transmitter. So, you know, some transmitters will have to just um, retire. But the antenna that you were using there, that, is that just to download the GPS data off the unit? Or is that to actually determine an azimuth to the location of the hen like a typical Yagi? That's a typical Yagi to determine the, the azimuth of the... So you're um, using both so. GPS transmitters and then just regular? No, so uh, what that is, so um, one of the, so that, that one um, slide showed the actual, um, Okay, oh, right here. Okay, on the left, you can see you can see the the Yagi transmitter. Um, this is this is at my office, but it's easy to see it here. So you have the Yagi um, receiver, that large unit. That's the base station, and then uh, the smaller receiver on the right. That's the the regular um, telemetry receiver. And uh, so, what with the GPS data, we have to get close enough to the to the um, turkey to be able to download those data. So that's what the base station is. Okay. So, yeah. Yep. So real quickly, just um, so hunters are aware, this is a, a great research project that we're starting out on. Um, and the question is gonna come out, what if I shoot a bearded hen that has one of these backpacks on, or what if in the fall I shoot one, am I in trouble? No, so the, um, all, of the, all of the hens that have a transmitter have reward leg bands. And uh, the transmitters have a, um, have a little tag on them that say, uh, you know, for reward, um, call such and such a number or, um, or email us. So, uh, and then and we actually, I'm not sure if those, if those tags will stay on, so we wrote on a Sharpie. Um, the, the phone number to call. Uh, but, you know, so with the last hen study, there were only a few transmitters that, uh, that we lost track of and, um, and that the hunter actually had to contact us. Um, one of them in particular, well, one we lost track of because it got hit by a train, but, um, and, but <laughs> that was okay. Uh, but there was one that we, that was sh actually the hunter had a bad shot. He actually shot the transmitter itself, and so um, that that uh, made the the transmitter unusable. Uh, and he actually called us, uh, but uh, you know the other ones we will just go and retrieve if they haven't if they haven't um, contacted us, and then they'll be getting a citation probably. But um, so we in those situations we always have law enforcement assist us with with that. But the overarching message, message. To hunters though is if they were to harvest one of these birds go ahead and call the number it's nothing that they're going to get cited for if it was a legal harvest and right that's accounted for in your methodology with this study knowing that hunters are are pred are predators of hens specifically in the fall um, and is something that is being accounted for in this study correct 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 Yes, it's being accounted for, and um, yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Andrew Ward. I'm the Northern Bob White Program Specialist. I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to talk to you all today, all of our commissioners, uh, executive director, deputy ex executive director, and uh, council here. Uh, what I'm here to talk to you today about is the Northern Bob White proposed season changes, and then just a brief overview on the uh, reintroduction effort itself. So we're proposing to extend Bob White hunting opportunity throughout most of the state. Uh, we're proposing to change the beginning of the season from that October 
to in August and changing the closing of the final portion of the season from that February uh, to a June. We're also proposing to eliminate the daily bag limits. Uh, now, why are we doing this and how can we do this? It, we're doing so because Northern Bob White, the wild population is extirpated. So, and on top of that, the Game Commission does not release Bob White, similar to how we do pheasant. Uh, so any Bob White hunting throughout the state is done so with private parties that are either raising or buying Bob White and releasing them themselves. So we'd like to eliminate that bag limit, uh, giving folks the opportunity, if they wanna put out a bunch of Bob White, they can harvest however many they put out and changing those seasons in a way to provide more opportunity for folks to get out in the field uh, while also continuing to restrict uh, some of those more sensitive times of the year for other species that are utilizing that habitat and more than likely uh, breeding during that time. Uh, so in addition to that, we also propose to close the release of and hunting of Bob White around the Bob White quail focus area. Uh, this is the area where, where we'll be reintroducing quail and uh, by closing hunting, it'll allow these wild birds the opportunity to establish their population in the area. And then also by closing the release of uh, propagated Bob White, it allows us the opportunity to prevent the uh, the mixing of genetics. We know that wild Bob White have uh, greater likelihood of survival and reproduction uh, than these penroid birds and, and mixing that genetics can have adverse effects. Uh, the border for this area was selected in a way to uh, prevent a dispersing wild bob white and a dispersing released bob white from meeting. Uh, the likelihood of that would be very low with this area. And, and on top of that, just the practicality of choosing some of these main roads that are more easily identifiable to the public as well as our own staff. Uh, so now moving forward, we're hitting a few key project checkpoints in the coming year. Uh, the first and, and one that's coming up the soonest is the National Bob White Conservation Initiative is sending a panel to give an unbiased assessment of the habitat on our site. Uh, from there, we'll take that information coupled with our management plan and other quantitative assessments that we have of the habitat as well as other species, uh, other grassland shrubland species that are currently using it. And we'll send that out to our potential source states. Uh, from there, they'll make the decision based on our practices and more often than not, the state of their own bobwhite populations uh, at the time and those that wanna move forward will create these formal agreements eventually uh, coming to the translocation itself. Uh, and I wanna to touch on a little bit more of the NBCI review panel and, and what they're looking for. And the goal is to come and observe the site uh, under winter conditions. So this is the time of year that, you know, the site frankly is, uh, at its worst, some might say. It's gonna be really challenging for Bob White in this time of year. Uh, so what Bob White will end up looking for, as well as uh, what this panel will look for, especially is some of that protective cover, some of that woody vegetation uh, to protect them from predation, as well as the elements. Uh, this assessment is gonna be more of a qualitative assessment. It's done by three experts that uh, are coming from around the country to view the site and, and kind of give an idea of like, you know, this is or is not uh, Bob White habitat. And I would suggest or not to move forward with this at this time. Uh, that being said, I, I feel pretty good about it. Uh, so once we have that, we'll pair that with our own uh, quantitative habitat surveys and our quantitative uh, assessments of other grassland, shrubland species, uh, including your point counts for other bird species, as well as our uh, woodcock surveys and the like uh, to send that out to these potential source states. Uh, so with that, I thank you all for the opportunity in presenting these uh, potential changes to seasons and bags. And uh, 
hope you approve it whenever the opportunity arises uh, to vote on the matter. And I'm available for any questions that you may have. Just for some clarification, because mm -hmm. uh, I know there's a ton of pheasant hunters out there that are mm -hmm. gonna that are gonna question this. Um, and you touched on it that um, you know right now the game commission is not in the business of of put and take for quail in the state of Pennsylvania like we are with pheasants. Um, so would it would it be accurate to say that um, if we can move forward with your season recommendations outside of that Letterkenny Army Depot area, um, that that would be more akin to where we're at with, say, chuckers in the state of Pennsylvania. Yes, that is a great comparison. And, and yeah, like, I could not agree more. Yes, exactly. All right. Well, thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Andrew DeSalvo. I am the veterinarian uh, with the Game Commission here. Uh, I'm anchoring this session. I will be short and sweet. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about today is the public comment that was received regarding the rabbit hemorrhagic disease response plan. It's a living document, so we're constantly making edits to it, but we had a formal public comment period during the month of October. So uh, during that month of October, or actually more than 30 days, we're, we have to allot 30 days, but we actually started it right after the September Board of Game Commissioners meeting through the month of October. Uh, we made an announcement, uh, INE did, with a press release following that September uh, 11th or 10th, excuse me, Board of Game Commissioners meeting. And then we also utilized social media, Facebook, as well as Twitter. I also was told that we used an Instagram story, whatever that is. We didn't get a ton of feedback, to be perfectly honest. We got one formal letter from the Northeast Beagle Gun Dog Federation. I think it's really challenging. That highlights it's really challenging to get people to care about diseases that aren't here yet. Um, I don't know historically how it was with CWD and how much public feedback there was prior to 2012, but um, I expect a similar trend might occur here. I'm not, of course, comparing deer hunters with lagomorph hunters, but we got some great feedback from that one organization they uh, highlighted a few things. So they encouraged really strict enforcement of our regulations. We have a few regs that prevent the release of domestic and wild lagomorphs on state game lands and prevent the release of any wild lagomorphs anywhere in Pennsylvania. So they really encouraged us to strictly enforce that. Uh, they highlighted their role as a, a uh, stakeholder and invested in positive outcomes in this plan and their willingness basically to share information that we develop and give to them. And so that was really exciting. And then something that they really, um, was really great that they pointed out was some executive order clarification. So we passed an executive order last July that prohibits the importation of wild lagomorphs and their parts or products from any state, area, territory, commonwealth that has detected it in wild or domestic lagomorphs uh, within the past 12 months. And one thing that I overlooked, but that we have in this response plan, is an actual list of areas that that applies to. And so they recommended, hey, have that list up on the web so we know at any time, we don't have to go digging through a plan that may have been updated a couple of weeks ago, just have that list of locations on the website. And so I thought that was a great suggestion. So I'm gonna work with Steve Smith and his team and get that updated on the rabbit hemorrhagic disease plan, um, or not plan, but the, the page. Um, they did also ask for some additional clarification that I really couldn't provide, and they were um, curious as permit holders doing field training. One of the suggested strategies we have in the response plan is potentially amending permits to prevent movement of high-risk parts and further spread of the disease, and it's really hard to predict what such an amendment might look like. Um, that would, of course, require an additional executive order to make it actual um, 
have some legal footing, but it really depends on whether or not an initial detection in Pennsylvania is in a domestic rabbit or if it's in a wild rabbit, if it's in a rural setting or an urban setting. There's so many factors that go into it that I didn't really want to get into that or commit to anything in a response plan. And so I'm going to kind of leave that, <laughs> leave that be. And then when it pops up, we're going to, of course, have to get some heads together and reach out to these stakeholders and see what's digestible, what's enforceable from our, 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 our standpoint. And so um, that was one thing that they did raise that we really couldn't address specifically. Some, in terms of the actual plan that I first presented last September um, and what has changed, not much has changed. We did um, take some of your comments to heart and made some tweaks in, in terms of some of our verbiage. Um, but a lot has actually changed in regards to the disease itself. So since then, it's actually been classified as endemic in all of those states you see up there in the western or southwestern United States. And endemic just means that the disease is regularly occurring in that area. So um, another important thing is that there have been multiple detections along the East Coast, only in domestic rabbits, but that match the strain from that southwestern outbreak. And they weren't tagged with importation of rabbits. So what that proves is that people, as fomites, are carrying virus on their person, on their boots or what have you, and actually transporting it across the country. So that's a little bit terrifying, but it's also what we tried to get out ahead of with that executive order banning the importation of those parts and encouraging other best management practices. So a little bit alerting, uh, concerning. The nearest detection to us to date is in New York, Montgomery County. That's, I don't know, 10, 20 miles west of Albany. And so not close enough to the Pennsylvania border to consider enacting some of the strategies that we discuss in that response plan, such as the establishment of RHD disease management areas. So, more disease management areas. Um, and that's about it. I told you I'd be quick. I'll welcome any questions. Um, I, uh, as this is a living document, as we approach an opportunity to vote on this in the future, by all means, I will share the most up-to-date document with you. There might be some very minor changes, but I would predict that potentially there may be new locations that I would have to add in the document um, prior to an a, a formal vote. So that would probably be the most significant change. Thank you very much. You got I, it. Uh, I do appreciate you getting out in front of this um, and, and being proactive. And I guess it's a good problem to have when, when it's hard to garner that support um, because it's not here yet. So. I mean, I hate, well, I don't know if I hate to say it, but I hope you continue to have that problem for a long time. Yeah, it's incredibly challenging once it gets in a wild population to manage. I've talked to managers out west who are somewhat resigned because it kind of spreads like wildfire, to use a perhaps a bad term, but it is really challenging, and oftentimes you have to kind of just rely on the wild population to develop immunity or natural immunity eventually. So it's, it's tough. The predators of those prey items might suffer or have to seek alternative prey for a couple of years. But what's, what is nice is that lagomorph populations can rebound. But we have concerns, right, with the snowshoe hare, the Appalachian cottontail, that we have potentially subpopulations that could be especially threatened. Absolutely. So. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So with that, that's a wrap for this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, we will reconvene tomorrow morning um, at 8.30 a.m. Thank you.